So we will now uh, resume our workshop. So uh, the next lecture is going to be presented by Mr. Seokwon Yoon. Thank you for your warm welcome. Uh, it's time for sleeping, right? And it's very nice raining day. And it's, it's like raid on day, okay? <laughs> okay, uh, this time uh, I will talk about the internal contamination monitoring, uh, this lecture. And I will make some um, presentation about the, the concept of internal monitoring. And I will introduce our uh, process. And I would like to make a discussion about this topic with you. Okay. This lecture, uh, I will talk about the basics of monitoring system, and, and I'd like to tell you the, the uh, what kind of monitoring method we use and in vivo in vitro biosay and public monitoring. And last, I will. I will tell you the current uh, monitoring system. Okay, let me uh, make a simple de definition of the uh, con radioactive contamination. It's the overview is the radioactive contamination is the presence of um, radioactive materials in a place where you do not want. And also it can give some harmful effect to the human or environment. In this case, we can call it very simply uh, contaminated. And also the contamination may present a risk to a person's health or the environment. So I think it's very important the control of contamination is one of the key concerns, especially in case of the emergency. So uh, as, uh, as, as we already seen the previous lecture, the internal contamination can happen through this, this kind of uh, uh, intake route, ingest, inhale, or injured by some specific situation. So there are uh, several factors we have to uh, think of this situation. The, uh, what kind of the, uh, the amount of radionuclide and energy and type, biological and radiological half-life, organ and chemical and physical properties. Actually, these factors we have to think of because uh, the monitoring work is uh, to calculate the committed effective dose. So we have to we have to get the information from these uh, several factors. Uh, the similar one, and you can see this figure. Uh, it's uh, there are uh, several uh, situations to be exposed from the radiation. Uh, in this figure, the internal exposure, there are several intake route, and you can see a specific radionuclide deposited on a specific uh, organ. So uh, we can know the concept of internal and external exposure. And this is a, a biokinetic model. We can know from this, uh, there are two color circles. The red one means the intake route, and blue, blue one is the exhalation, ah, uh, remove, removal situation. So we can know the, the radionuclide can enter the body through this uh, intake route, uh, ingestion or inhalation, and so on, and the radionuclide can be transferred by the blood or any other uh, the water. So we can calculate the whole process by mathematical work, okay? And this is a simple figure for uh, internal dose assessment. So we, ha we can know the, the ultimate purpose of this assessment is to calculate a community effective dose. To achieve this goal, we have to know the estimated intake uh, from the accident. So 
we have to use this kind of uh, bioassay techniques to uh, estimate the intake amount. Okay, so I think the uh, purpose, uh, the achieve, uh, the ultimate purpose of the monitoring is to estimate the intake by using this uh, bioassay method. So uh, I look for the, the definition of the contamination monitoring. The, the purpose of contamination monitoring is to ensure the levels of radioactive contamination do not exceed some criteria to protect public and environment. But in this lecture, we are going to focus on the public monitoring system. And we can make some uh, mm, can make some decision to uh, respond the real real case uh, based on the monitoring result, like the contamination or re monitoring, when the contamination level exceeds the action levels. So actually, we have to have some data from the accident, and we can make uh, uh, our actions based on the raw data. And this is a general health physics guidelines. We can refer to this one. You can see uh, we have to gather the information about the incident history or reconstruction, and we can use this kind of uh, some biosay sample collecting techniques. And this this figure f figure shows us uh, the potential exposure pathways. Actually, the, as I said, the, the radiation, internal radiation monitoring is, is just to calculate the intake amount. So because uh, there are a lot of situations if the radiation released to the environment, you can see the radiation, radi radioactive materials can transfer by air, water, plant, uh, animal, and so on, it will be deposited in the human body. So we have to know how much uh, is deposited in the body, okay? Uh, uh, actually, I surveyed uh, what kind of radionuclei we do use in our in normal situations. Uh, there are three categories for normal situations. University 7 from tritium to californium 252, industrial 3, military 3. So this radionuclide is used in normal situations. So we can guess that this kind of radionuclide can be dispersed by the accident in this site. And also, when the radiation accident happened in the nuclear power plant, we, we have to focus on the monitoring of iodine-131, cesium, and strontium. And also, some terror or RDD, uh, RDD accident, we can have or collect some information about this event. So this is a, a typical photo of this kind of radionuclide. Okay. And many other international or expert uh, expert group has proposed some bioassay techniques to the public. And this is this list from the IEA document. You can see uh, several radionuclide, and each radionuclide uh, has recommended to be monitored with this kind of uh, in vivo bioassay or in vitro bioassay. You can see, for example, uh, for monitoring the cobalt-60, the long counting uh, is recommended for, for internal contamination verification. And you can f refer to this table, but it is not fixed method, but it is uh, recommended in the, uh, for respond to the real case. In case of the in vitro biosay, uh, you can 
list, you can refer to this uh, table. If the tritium was contaminated and the urine samples uh, will be useful by using the liquid scintillation counter. Or plutonium, uh, urine or feces, uh, alpha spectrometry will be useful. So we can refer to. Or uh, if you have already established the uh, bioassay techniques, you can choose. But the, all the monitoring methods must be verified, validated. And this is a, a simple description about the in vivo and in vitro bioassay. Uh, in vivo bioassay is the measurement of uh, radioactive material in the body using instrument. And detected uh, radiation emitted from the radioactive material in the body. So in ca whole body counter or organ monitor is the, is a sample, uh, is a, is a um, instrument of for in vivo bioassay. In case of in vitro bioassay, the, is the measurement to determine the presence of or to estimate the amount of uh, radioactive material in excreta, like urine, feces, and nasal smears. So you can see it's a main difference. If you uh, measure the human body, uh, it's, it is called as a uh, in vivo biosay. If you use the uh, excreta or any other uh, samples from collected from the human, it is uh, in vitro biosay. Uh, in vivo biosay, uh, the whole body counter is the in vivo biosay. Uh, you can see uh, counting systems. And there are several types uh, to use for whole body counting. Uh, this is a stand-up type, scanning bed, and chair type. So it depending on the, the um, position of the human body. And this is a shielding facility. And geometry of a whole body counter, uh, arc, stretcher, chair, uh, scanning bed geometry. Actually, radiation measurement is, is to calculate the correct uh, counting efficiency. Uh, in case of the human body, we, in the normal situation, the operator uh, make a co correcting efficiency by using this kind of a fixed position. So uh, there are several geometry and stand-up or uh, several types uh, the operator can use in the uh, radiation in the radiation emergency situations. And this is a calibration phantoms. As you can guess, a uh, human is not a this kind of plastic bottle, but uh, in Normal case, uh, this this shows a, a very common figure of the human body. So uh, the operator can use this uh, water water uh, water water bottle, and, and it depending on the size, uh, following the age, adult and children. And in vivo biosay are also useful technique for uh, in vitro uh, in, in contamination monitoring internal. And organ counter, thyroid, lung. And you can see uh, this is a thyroid monitor and lung counter. Actually, uh, some specific radionuclide uh, tends to be deposited on a specific human organ. In that case, we can apply this instrument to the uh, real situation. Uh, in this case, uh, we also can use uh, these organ phantoms like neck or lung phantoms. And whole body counting is feasible for nuclei emitting X or gamma rays. It will be useful for this X or gamma rays. And also it is useful for nuclei uh, energy beta uh, but the uh, disadvantage of this technique is uh, is to it should be removed the the skin contamination or phantom calibration and actually 
all the people have the same the chest wall, do not have the same chest wall. So we have to also consider these kind of factors for counting correctly. Uh, nowadays, many institutes have launched their uh, mobile monitoring systems to respond to the uh, emergency as soon as possible. So uh, this uh, whole body counting or organ counter can be applied to these uh, mobile systems. If the uh, contaminated radionuclide emit the alpha or beta radio, uh, radionuclide, the samples uh, can be used for in vitro biosay. Uh, the typical sample is the urine and fecal samples breast, blood, nose blow, and nasal swabs are also can be used in some specific situation. And also for worker, the air monitoring, like personal air sampler, uh, can be applied for this technique. And these biological samples can be measured by using this uh, liquid disintegration counter, uh, alpha and gamma spectrometry, and gas proportional counter. It depends on the sample types or content. As you know, the alpha and beta have a very weak uh, penetrating power, so uh, that those, those radionuclides must be extracted from the raw samples by using these chemical techniques. Uh, so uh, in vitro biostay must be treated uh, with this this kind of uh, method. Uh, this is ashing or wet ashing method to reduce the sample volume or distillation for tritium or extraction chromatography for actinite radionuclide. And also uh, the biological samples uh, can be measured with these fixed volume vials. This is a 90 milliliter bottle for gamma spectrometry. This is a one liter Barinelli beaker for gamma. Uh, the difference between two of them is the volume and we can calculate minimum detectable level. And this file is for liquid scintillation counter uh, for alpha and beta counting. This disk uh, this uh, disk type counting source is for alpha spectrometry system. So it depends on the, the uh, counting instrument. The biological samples is feasible for nuclide emitting alpha or beta particles and you have already known the urine is mostly widely used. But the disadvantage is sample preparation and total collection of urine or feces uh, might be dif difficult. Okay, this is the biosay introduction. And I will talk about the public monitoring in the radiation situation. Uh, I search some materials from the internet or book. Uh, there are several classification of initial monitoring in radiation emergency. The first is external contamination level, environmental gamma dose rate, environmental contamination level, and the uh, internal contamination levels in people is one, one category of the public monitoring. Uh, the internal contamination levels monitoring is enabled to enable people who could potentially have internal contamination level high enough to cause deterministic effects. So the result can be used to decide for decision to be made on the need for treatment and the, and the monitoring will also help to establish a magnitude of stochastic risk to health. So uh, let's imagine the situation. Uh, as, you, as you know, the radiation accident 
shows a very big, very huge uh, disaster situation. In that case, there are a lot of people to be monitored we have to do. So we can, we can do the work and we have, when we have to make some decision for the additional uh, work, we can use the public monitoring systems because uh, we have to do the survey work within a sh very short time. Uh, and the public monitoring uh, can be carried out using uh, simple handheld radiation monitors. And uh, because, uh, because in that case, uh, many people have involved in this uh, survey uh, situation, survey work with this handheld radiation monitor. And the monitor is a special light task and the steps should be trained in normal situation. And it's important that the decade records are, should be kept because uh, long-term follow-up work we also do after the situation, accident situation. And you can see a simple list for uh, public monitoring. This port portable uh, monitoring equipment you can refer to, but uh, this list is uh, list is for the equipment needed for public monitoring. Alpha and beta uh, contamination monitor is capable capable of detecting both alpha and beta contamination levels, and portable gamma spectrometry equipment. Uh, and so, uh, wipe sample taking kit and laser swab sample taking kit and so on. So these are very minimum instrument for radiation emergency and we have to, we can add a more, uh, more uh, instrument or equipment to respond to the real situations. Uh, this is figure. The, uh, this is alpha and, alpha and beta counter. You can see a white, you can see a filter paper. And it can be used for uh, laser smear or smear samples. This is a port portable liquid scintillation counter for urine test. And this is a laser smear kit. And this is, this is the equipment for gamma counting. Uh, and actually, this is a handheld uh, gamma count System, gamma spectrometry system, but you can apply this instrument for cesium or thyroid organ counter like this. And you can refer to uh, this data from the TMT handbook. As I said, uh, we, the Kirams also have opened the mobile radio biosail lab uh, like this, and we also have the system to respond in the on-site on on situation. So one part uh, consists of whole body counter, uh, in vivo uh, biosay equipment, like whole body counter, thyroid monitor, uh, portal monitor. And the other uh, consists of uh, in vitro biosay, like uh, gamma spectrometry system, germanium detector, liquid scintillation counter. So we can respond the, the accident uh, with this uh, mobile laboratory system as soon as we can. And also the we uh, and also the you know you have to uh, establish your own the respond process like this. Uh, this process, procedure, this is the procedure for internal contamination monitoring. Uh, you can see the whole process, uh, how you can guess uh, the internal contamination. Okay, you can see. And if, for example, the visitor uh, was monitored by using the simple detector, if the measurement result is above annual limit or criteria, you can refer to this figure and uh, you can, the visitor can be, uh, 
the uh, visitor transport to the hospital or uh, decontamination or go home, any other uh, additional actions we do, like with this simple process. And also if the uh, visitor shows uh, the, the result, resu the measurement result of visitor uh, shows the upper level of criteria, the hospital emergency team can involve the perform the special monitoring like whole body counting or excretion analysis or thyroid measurement like using this colorful um, colorful graph are you okay it's very nice afternoon And this figure, we can guess. Uh, this, is, this is a very common situation. Uh, we can focus in the radiation disaster. So the US CDC have proposed the population monitoring. The population monitoring is the, the mm, monitor, uh, monitoring the people or, and evaluate the uh, the, this public internal contamination or external contamination. So we can do the additional action uh, like uh, medical treatment or external contamination, internal and decontamination system. And the fo long term follow up uh, health effect we can do for uh, response to the uh, accident. So you can see a very simple diagram. Uh, red one means the mm, the population in the accident site, and the hospital shelter. The blue one is the CRC community reception center. is located between uh, accident and hospital or shelter, and the, all the people must be surveyed uh, through this CRC center, uh, and the a visitor uh, will be transferred to hospital or shelter. So uh, this CRC center will provide the screening people for radioactive contamination and washing decontamination and registering people for uh, follow-up and for further care, the, the additional work to do. Okay. So this is a, uh, this is a uh, example process of CRC center. When the visitor uh, arrived at the entrance of the CRC center, the visitor will be sorted in the initial sorting. And the visitor will be transferred to for first aid or the whole body screening or partial body screening and so on. And you can refer to. And I think this is a very uh, effective way to respond to uh, radiation emergency, okay, for especially for internal contamination monitoring. And from 2010, Kirams has opened the radiation effect clinic. And you can see a simple diagram. Uh, we also uh, provide the internal or external uh, dosimetry or survey system. When the visitor arrived at the clinic, the uh, external contamination monitoring we do, and a uh, medical doctor will collect some information about from the visitor and the uh, urine bio, say, for uh, gross alpha and beta analysis, or whole body counting for gamma-emitting radionuclide, will do by the operator. And if the if, if the one was contaminated by this kind of uh, radionuclide, the special monitoring will be followed up for dosimetry. And this is a QRAMS internal contamination monitoring process. So we have, uh, we have um, make uh, some criteria about the alpha and beta or gamma activity, and we will uh, make our action uh, based on this figure. Then uh, we 
we will do the uh, special monitoring if the visitor uh, was contaminated, is contaminated based on this criteria. And you can see a uh, uh, very alpha and beta, alpha, beta, and gamma spectrum uh, from this uh, instrument for identification and quantification of radionuclide. My, my time is 45 minutes, but I end up the, in 30 minutes. Uh, this is what my best is. Okay, <laughs> and this is for you. <laughs> Anyone with a question or comment? Cleaning the urine. urine. Yeah, and the, I mean, the victim should be stay for how many hours mm -hmm. before they can leave? We do the sample, urine sample analysis. Uh, in normal situation, uh, the whole process will take uh, two or three days. But in case of the emergency, eight hours for actinide analysis. And we also do the, the intercomparison inter program with NIST for emergency and routine situations. Yes. Then the patient should be stay for hmm? three days? Excuse me? The, the, the victim, I mean, and the people have to stay. Uh, how, many, how many hours have to stay uh, for screening? Okay. Uh, means. Or only single urine sampling, or you need many time of sampling. Mm, it depends on the situation. But in case of the emergency, uh, the spot sample, spot urine sample, uh, can be used. But the ideal time for collecting is 24 hour. And yes, yeah, so we recommend it to stay uh, 24 hours. Above, yes. I would ask if you could uh, you, you, uh, show the, the number of uh, technologies you used for. Sorry. You, you use the number of technologies for uh, in vivo, in vitro monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, have you ever uh, explored the mass spec technology? Mass spec? Yes, mass spectrometry. ICPMS ah, or, or, or other mass spec, whatever. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, we have to. We don't have uh, ICPMS yet, okay. but uh, we uh, we have a plan to. Uh, okay. We have plan to. Uh, is okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Thank you. Do yeah. the work. Yeah. Um, thank you. Very interesting presentation. Uh, my question is about um, the equipment. Whether the um, radiochemical laboratories, uh, which use usually are used for environmental monitoring, can they also be used for human samples? The equipment, because for some countries, um, obviously the equipment for whole body counting and other technology may be not uh, accessible, too expensive. They don't have. For example, uh, I was recently visiting Singapore, and uh, it was uh, um, the question came up whether uh, it was necessary to acquire uh, very expensive equipment when actually the risk of a nuclear accident is very low in the country, so it will not be justified probably. But they do have radiochemical lab doing environmental monitoring. So could you uh, elaborate? In your opinion, is it possible to use for example, um, radiochemical or um, I don't, know, don't remember the name of the equipment, what is used for um, air, water, uh, and um, let's say earth samples, also to use the same equipment for human samples. Uh, environmental samples? Environmental monitoring equipment, equipment, can it be used also for human samples? Oh yes, similar. 
is absolutely similar? Very do they similar. need special training? Yes. Or is it the same laboratory can do it? Yeah. Uh, the measurement equipment uh, is uh, very similar with the environmental monitoring systems, but the preparation method is a little bit different with those, it depending on the sample types and chemical or physical properties of each sample. Right? And thank you. Sleepy? <laughs> now it's time for me to sleep. Okay? <laughs> Ah, I guess, uh, you know, after the lunch, we, 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 we do feel sleepy, but I am. <laughs> uh, well, you know, this morning, uh, we, we had a talk, and uh, Jinchi talked about all the uh, fundamental uh, things on uh, radiation, ef radiation effect, uh, the biodust emission models, uh, volcanic models, the dust emission models. Uh, just now, uh, Dr. Yung gave a uh, 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 presentation on the uh, monitoring equipment, uh, monitoring procedures. Uh, I'm going to give you uh, 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 an update on two projects, which is related to emergency monitoring and dose assessment. Uh, no, okay. So uh, before I, I talk, I think uh, the list of uh, uh, publications I made here, I think they are quite useful. I feel quite useful. Uh, you might want to check. The first one uh, is the European uh, Katimara report. It's on thyroid monitoring. Uh, it provides a lot of technical details on how to do, uh, very practical. Uh, Dr. Kurohara here uh, published a paper on whole body monitoring during Fukushima uh, response, which is uh, the real experience, very practical again. Uh, NCRP uh, report 161 uh, address management of persons contaminated with the uh, radionuclides. Uh, very useful document, I, I use all the time. And uh, the CDC population monitoring guide just now Dr. you mentioned, he showed you some details. Uh, this is the, the 2014 version is the second, which is a uh, very good one. Uh, the last one uh, published last year uh, by uh, European Union, uh, called the Samesan project. Uh, they gave recommendations uh, step by step on public health and medical management, something like that, which is very, very good for me. Uh, I think uh, at least here to share with you, uh, if it might be useful. I, I'm going to talk about two projects. Uh, the one th is called the Rampan Project, monitoring dose assessment for children following uh, emergency. Uh, the second one is uh, GHSI project, uh, we call it emergency radionuclide biopsy in the comparison exercise. And uh, just for your information, the GSI uh, secretary Richard is, is this room actually. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to start with the first one. So. This way. So Rampan, uh, within the Rampan, we have a, a small informal working group with a number of people in this room, actually. <laughs> we hold uh, uh, Dr. Kurhara, Zanad, myself, we're here. We, 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 we do this way. We, for 
facilitated collaborations, you know, within different labs uh, to address some uh, technical uh, gaps. Uh, I think I have one more slide here, uh, give you a little bit more details. Uh, we also particip participate in the WSO uh, guideline development and uh, we provide advice on how to manage internal contamination. Uh, we also uh, want to uh, uh, help each other to developing capabilities. We have not done much on this. So children project. You may ask why we have a children project specifically. So we know uh, children, they are in, a, in their developing stage. Uh, they are much more vulnerable than, than adults, than us, when they get exposed to uh, uh, radiation. Uh, and they, they will have a higher dose per uh, they, they will have, uh, they're more sensitive to radiation health effect. Uh, in fact, if you check the past accident happened in uh, Guyana, in Brazil, or in Chernobyl, or in Fukushima, uh, you will see uh, uh, in monitoring and assess assessing those for children, we, we did uh, have uh, encountered some troubles or challenges in doing so. Uh, that's why we want to have this one. So it has two parts. The first part is to derive reference values for in vitro mon monitoring. The second part is to, to derive calibration factors for thorough monitoring. You may say, what's this for? If you uh, recall the presentation this morning, uh, Dr. Ha gave um, how to do internal dose assessment. <laughs> you will see it, it takes a long time from uh, your, well, you, you will monitor people, you get the data, and then you do all the uh, calculations uh, you will see how much those the person might get, uh, do we need to treat or something. So the objective for this one is to help you to skip that part. We try to, you know, do, we do all the calculations for you, so you use the numbers directly when, when you uh, uh, respond to the emergency. Uh, I mentioned the uh, NCRP publication 161 just now, uh, which, uh, it's a good one, and it's, it introduces uh, a, a new operational quantity called a clinical decision guide. What does that mean? It means <laughs> an intake, an intake of radionuclides which trigger medical treatment, medical intervention. Uh, a little bit hard to, to, to link this together, but it's true. It's, it's the CDG, the clinical decision guide, the unit is Baccalaure, okay. Uh, for an adult, it needs to meet the most restrictive criterion of the three. Either 30 day RBE weighted absorbed dose for, to the lung, which is one gray equivalent, or a 30 day RBE equivalent absorbed dose to red marrow, which is a quarter uh, gray equivalent, or a committed effect dose of uh, quarter silver. Uh, one of them, the mo oh no, not one of the most uh, restri restrictive one to this one. This is all good. If you read a document that, that thick, it's a very good document. For adults, it's fine. But for children, it is no, not good. The reason that it is said, the children, for children, the intake is defined as 20% of adult intake. You might have recognized a problem now. Children, when we talk about children, one year old is a child. 17 years old is a child. They are very different in size. So in this project, what we did, I actually called the, the chair who made this document and got agreed on that. What we did, we did, did Deviated from their recommendation, we use 20% of the dose rather than 20% of the intake. So starting from there, we worked on 13 radionuclides for 28 scenarios, uh, 
Dr. High is, is one member of this part. Uh, we check, we uh, check the you know, potential contamination pathways, inhalation, uh, or, 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 or ingestion, and we we check the biopsy quantities for you know for this either either urine or fecal quantities. Uh, we come up with this one one example. This is the intake calculated calculated CBG for child uh, for ch for children. Uh, give you an example for strong immunity and uh, uh, plutonium to 239. And if you move to this table, uh, now you can use this table in, in theory. Uh, I just read this out. Uh, maybe I'll give you an give, give example. If, uh, for a five-year-old child, uh, if, uh, if he got contaminated with a uh, strong immunity, top M, by inhalation. Uh, if you got urine samples from, from him on day seven, for example, and the calculated CDG is 910 uh, back there in, in the 24-hour urine sample. If you get urine, you measure, you compare your number to this number. If your number is smaller, that's okay. If, if your number is bigger, that means uh, you need to treat. So there are, in total, there are 40 tables. We published this one uh, on Health Physics Journal. Uh, it's 40 tables, table by table. Uh, I consider it as uh, complementary to the publication 161, NCRP. Uh, because they don't have this table, this this number for this. The next part of the monitoring project is for thyroid monitoring. Similar purpose. Uh, in case of uh, uh, emergency, you get someone contaminated. You will pick a, a, a detector, a meter, to measure, and uh, you get num the first number you, you, you might get is is counter rate. If from that counter rate, if immediately we can check the table, get the numbers, we know this person how much intake, how much uh, uh, dose to, you know, the 30-day 30, 30 dose or, or, or organ dose, in this case will be thyroid dose, or the effective dose, that will help you see if all the calculations. Uh, in this project we call the calibration factor, so basically uh, based on your uh, counter rate, you will get that number immediately from tables. We picked four uh, detectors, uh, with one used very widely in Fukushima response, uh, one used in Europe, Europe, European countries, the, the, the corner one, and, uh, and one used in Canada, and one used in nuclear medicine. The one, well, <laughs> people are asked why we have one in nuclear medicine for emergency response. Uh, the reason that here in Asian countries, we are good people. If, if, if we are asked to go somewhere for screening or, uh, or, or, or measurement, we, we go. In North America, people, m many people, they don't go. They go to hospital directly. That's why we have a unit uh, um, for, from hospital. Uh, we we used the Phantom series. I, I put a picture there, uh, just for your information. It will be uh, available for public consultation very soon. For RCRP is going to publish this this series as international reference. Uh, we use age-dependent biokinetics, uh, basically to calculate if I have a unit intake of iodine by inhalation. If that inhalation is acute, that means in a short period of time. Uh, in uh, 10 hours later, 20 hours later, where it will be, the distribution. Uh, and from there, and uh, we, 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 we calculate. We also use the dose coefficient collected from various, uh, various sources, but mainly developed by Oak Ridge National Lab. We did the Monte Carlo simulation, and uh, I just show you the numbers. Well, by the way, bef 
before before I show the number, uh, these the four top of calibration factors we have. Basically, if you have a, a, a unit, if you have if you have a counter rate, you will know uh, the intake by using the calibration factor for intake. You will know the numbers for absorb the dose, 30 day absorb the dose, uh, thorough the dose, and effective dose. You may ask why we have a 30 day absorb the dose here. Uh, for thorough monitoring, uh, usually we don't consider uh, the deterministic, deterministic effect because the intake usually not that big. We put it here just in case if someone have a very significant intake. If the intake is really big, so the absorbed dose, the 30 day absorbed dose will be important because we might see some uh, uh, tissue reaction in thyroid. Very quickly, I go through the tables. Uh, this is for calibration factor for intake. Uh, this one is for 30 day absorbed dose, thyroid dose, and effective dose. I'll give you an example here. Uh, if you, if if a, a five-year-old child get a acute inhalation intake of more than 131, uh, 24 hours later you pick a, uh, the cup test 3,000 to measure, and you 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 come to the table. You will see uh, in this table uh, it is 1.24 times 10 minus 2, uh, the unit is millisiever per CPS. That means if your count rate is 1 CPS, uh, the corresponding committed effective dose is 1.24 10 to minus 2 millisiever. In, in other words, 12 microsiever. So you basically, what you need to do in this case, you multiply the counter rate numbers you got uh, with this number, so you get the dose. Uh, I, I don't have the laser part here. Or maybe I do. Thank you. Uh, so, so this, uh, this project, there are some limitations for the, for the thyroid part. Uh, I think this morning, uh, the so the, the new uh, bioclinical model for, for Alden uh, was first published by Rick Lucky uh, uh, and then uh, published by RCRP in 137, right? On this one. Uh, in this project, we did not use because we started early, <laughs> right? Uh, we, we might check, we might come back to, to update this one in the future. Uh, the presence of short-lived Alden isotopes can be a problem. I think uh, the best person in this room, Dr. Kurohara, can talk more on this one, because in responding to Fukushima res uh, accident, you, you did have this experience. Uh, if, uh, if we do have short-lived Alden isotopes, uh, the, not, the, 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 the net result will be uh, overestimating, overestimation of the dose. Uh, R131 and the other radionuclei incorporated in other organs or, or I mean, contaminated air or hair or air uh, or will contribute to your, your environment if you don't uh, take care of that. Uh, another one is, well, we, we said that we, we for this table, these numbers are good for acute inhalation. That means short period of time inhalation of 131, but sometimes you might have uh, a prolonged inhalation. Sometimes sometime we might have a repeated inhalation. Uh, during the Fukushima uh, accident, I remember this number of episodes, right? It's, you know, after the big one, the small ones as well. So that would be the real life uh, uh, thing we, we need to consider. Uh, other contamination pathways, we have to consider uh, during uh, after Chernobyl, uh, people you know have uh, actually quite a high intake from food injection, right? Food or milk, 
uh, rather, 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 rather than inhalation. Another thing uh, is that uh, uh, stable iron thyroid blocking might be used before, before your measurement, if that has been used, so the, 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 it will change. So your, mer your, your mer did, measurement data need to be uh, uh, reconsidered for this thing. Uh, about the uh, Katimaya project, uh, the one I mentioned before, they have a kind of recommendation on this. If you read the document, you will learn how to do this if, uh, if, uh, if the uh, stable iron has been used. Uh, so the last thing is I think it's very important I have to repeat here. Information we uh, obtained using these calibration factors cannot be used for diagnostic purpose, but it can help us for triage purpose. The first uh, uh, round of uh, uh, screening, it can, can be used for screening. If someone, if, if the screening shows someone get a relatively high intake, high dose, and we need to go uh, for more detailed monitoring. Second part of the presentation uh, is different. Than, it's quite different than, than, than the one I just spoke. Uh, it's for GSI uh, emergency radio class by uh, two in the comparison exercise. You might be wondering what is GSI now. Uh, GSI is, uh, is a, a group of uh, G7 countries plus Mexico plus uh, WHO as observer uh, formed uh, 16 years ago after September 11. Uh, the number of working groups uh, talking, uh, they're working on uh, uh, pandemic uh, influenza, working on chemical event, uh, or, uh, or other things. We have one group working on read uh, uh suite working group here. And yesterday we discussed the work plan. We just updated our work plan. I'm going to show you one project we did here. Uh, which is on, on, on intercomparison exercise. Uh, in the year of 2013, we did a survey. We really want to know the GSI member countries, uh, what is our capability in responding to uh, uh, emergency? Uh, what is our, our capability in, in, in uh, reducing nuclear policy, specifically on that? Uh, based on the survey, we identified the gaps, three, one, two, three, there. The first one is that for thermal radionuclides, we don't have a rapid method. It remains valid until now, <laughs> actually. After so many years working on that, until now, for thermal radionuclides, we don't have a rapid method yet. Uh, the second one is that if in a sample, you have many, many radionuclides, uh, how to do the assessment, what would be the procedure? The third one is that uh, you do a uh, measurement with the biopsy part, you do do some assessment, you do medical management. Suppose this to be done, uh, you know, seamlessly in a short period of time. Uh, are we able to do this? This is the third three questions. So the first exercise we did focused on one single radionuclide in a sample. Just one nucleide in one sample. Uh, we give a scenario here, by the way. Uh, we ask labs to say, uh, uh, to check their capability uh, on, 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 on bioassay, on dose assessment, on uh, the ability to give advice on medical intervention. Uh, the scenario was that a person, an uh, adult, reference adult, uh, got uh, uh, intake, acute intake of Mercer 241. The intake is 1.5 megabeg. I will tell you, I will explain later why that number. Uh, you know, after that, on day two, we collect his daily urine samples. And each participant lab, we get 100 milliliter, and then we, uh, well, 
or come back late, and we ask them questions here. Six hours upon receiving the samples, you need to email back to see if this sample is active or not. If you say active, tell us how did you know. And 72 hours after we receive the sample, you tell us what's inside, how much, and what method you used. And if we got this report from the lab, we ask them within another 24 hours, tell us what's the intake, what is the dose, uh, what's the committed effect dose here, and w what, which method and tools you used to do this kind of estimation. And another question is that, uh, does this person need to be uh, me treated, medically treated? And if you say yes, I will say which guideline you use, we will refer to. So the very simple exercise, actually. Uh, it has been published uh, in the year of 2016, uh, reducing potential symmetry. I'll show you uh, the word a little bit small. I think a little bit hard for for, for you guys sitting in the back to see. Screening. Well, this, remember this is Amerism 241. Already told the labs, it is Amerism 241. <laughs> okay, so screening part. Uh, oh, I lied. I did not tell them. I said it's, it, it has one reading class inside. Uh, so. Some labs use gamma spec to screen the sample at 100 milliliter, about half a back layer in, inside. But they don't know this number, by the way. They, they use gamma spec to screen. Uh, some labs use uh, uh, ICPMS to screen. And the majority of labs use liquid ventilation counting uh, with gross, gross alpha beta discrimination screen, which is fine. Uh, But there's one lab use whole body counter to screen. <laughs> one lab use whole body counter to screen. Uh, uh, apparently, they, they do not give any number on this one. You can, you can see that. Uh, they cannot see anything. Uh, just now, uh, in the before my presentation, I asked Dr. Yun, uh, do you have uh, ICPMS uh, techniques here? Uh, in my mind, that is uh, something uh, quite good for bioassay especially for the long-lived ones. Long-lived ones means, you know, if uh, the half-life is 100 years or longer, it uh, offers apparent benefit than, than uh, uh, reducing accounting techniques because, you know, we are, mer we are marrying the number of atoms rather than the number of uh, radiation emitted from, from the sample. Uh, Majority of the labs use alpha spec transitional method. Uh, this is not surprising because ma majority of the participant labs are come from Europe. They they really like alpha spec. <laughs> uh, well, uh, the one lab use gamma spec. They just can't. They did a long counting, uh, which is uh, fine, but uh, with large uncertainty. We saw you here. Uh, all these numbers not too bad. I said, you know, expect, except for one lab, they could not get any number because they use whole body, count, whole body counter. They cannot use, they cannot give, give, give any number for this. Other labs, they did very well. Uh, remember the true value, the sparked value is, is, is 4.3, not too far. Uh, but there's some surprise. Some labs they give more isotopes. We told them in this sample there's one isotope only. <laughs> they give more, which is a bonus. Uh, the dose, intake the dose, all fine, but with one lab, did not apply the, uh, I would say the information possibly, did not uh, read the instruction very well. So they did not get the correct intake and the dose. I believe the reading that they did not uh, pay attention to the number of which day the sample was collected. We, we, we said it's on day two, they possibly use day one, something like that. Uh, medical advice, uh, all good. All labs recommended treatment. This person needs to be treated. 
although the uh, guidelines they use are different. Uh, there's mainly three guidelines. One is the TMT handbook, I think uh, led by developed led by Janat. <laughs> See your work. Uh, the second one uh, is the NCRP publication 161, I mentioned a number of times. There's another one, IE publication, IEPR Medical 2005. The three major reference they use, although different. TMT set the uh, com committed effect dose for 200 mini fever to, tri to trigger treatment, while NCRP 250. Uh, but all recommended treatment, they also give uh, how to treat uh, the doses, whatever, which is good. But the gaps, I, I want to give a quick summary of the gaps. Uh, after the exercise, we, we had a kind of very good discussion. Um, colleagues from US CDC mentioned that the 72 hour time, turnaround time, is too too long. I, I said, you know, for this kind of alpha emitter uh, bioassay, if you can give numbers within three days, it would be good. But he said, no. <laughs> Suppose we give numbers quicker. I just, uh, just now, before my presentation, Dr. Yong said, in emergency, you have eight hours, right? I think that might be better <laughs> than this, three days. Uh, yeah, the reference models, uh, I, I'm, I'm not going to repeat this one. I said we, we, you, they, they are internationally uh, accepted reference models uh, for biokinetics, for dosimetry. But when we use that one, we should uh, pay attention to use it correctly. Uh, same thing to the international guidelines on medical, medical management. Second exercise. This is a little bit more uh, difficult, actually. This time, we're testing the labs to try one sample with four radionuclides. It's not one. The four radionuclides, uh, we picked uh, Astronium-90, Cis-137, Rosinium-106, uh, Plutonium-239. You may ask why Rosinium-106. Many people ask, ask me this question. I'll explain now. Uh, if you check the source term of Chernobyl extent, okay, you will see the emission of 106 is quite significant. And for us working on internal dosimetry, we know <laughs> this gives the largest dose among the four. This is the number one dose contributor in, in that case. Uh, that's why we put, that, we put this one on the list. Another reading. This way, we are going to have uh, three beta emitters. This is the most difficult part. Uh, I will show you why, why it's difficult later on. So, so the 18 labs from 16 countries participated, including many, many, many majority of the labs from Rampa family. Uh, we, we gave 250 milliliters of samples to each lab, quite generous to uh, allow them to finish all the measurements. And the sparking level, we started with the CDG level, which is quite high. Uh, with, 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 with level derived from the CDG, I have to do this way. Uh, this is for Ruthenium 106, because it gives the last of the dose. And all the, the rest of them, the ratio of ASTOPs refer, refer to, to the source term in Chernobyl extent exactly the same ratio we used. So we gave the labs, we asked them to get back to us within 72 hours upon receiving the sample. Uh, well, the first thing I want to say that if I, I receive uh, instruction on these samples, I have this kind of background, uh, a mixture of regional class started from uh, the very uh, nuclear power plant scenario, I would first thing I would say what method I'm going to use to screen the sample before I do any assessment, the serious assessment, because I don't know what's inside. I need to have a kind of idea what's there. 
So I can pick the correct method to assay. But unfortunately, among the 18 labs, eight labs did not, did not do that part. They jump to the direct uh, 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 bowel assay assessment <laughs> immediately. Uh, the, the, they got some trouble later on. Okay. Okay, the, the method, I, I, I don't have a slide for this one. There's too, ma too, too much material on that. 18 labs for reading class, think about that. But uh, I want to highlight here uh, some labs, they don't have uh, uh, the techniques required for specific reading class in this exercise. Uh, for example, plutonium. Plutonium, in this case, uh, the, the spark level is about 10 milli back per liter. It's quite, quite low, actually. Uh, they, they cannot handle that. Uh, okay. Only one third of the 18 labs reported the numbers for all four reading class. Only, only, only one third of them. And the one lab did not report any. Okay. I have to say the 18 labs, the 18 labs are possibly, you know, uh, among the, the good ones in the world. And uh, only six of them reported results for all four reading class. So it has been published uh, in the year of 2017 on reading superstructure dosimetry here. Uh, just show you the sparking level here. It's, I said it's not low actually. It's quite high. <laughs> and then in real life experience, uh, emergency, we may have level much lower than this. If we cannot handle this high level, and this, it will be hard for us to handle low level. Uh, just show you the numbers. Swantium 90. It's, it's remember that the, the table here is 20 back per liter. At this level, uh, thumb labs you know, give, give numbers this way. Uh, eight, the sparking level is 80 back per liter, quite high. So still, thumb labs give uh, uh, very different numbers uh, with a high uncertainty. Even this one has 137 measured by gamma, right? So it's very, 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 very uh, one, one lab at least. The numbers quite, quite ugly. Uh, oh, uh, this plutonium. So I want to say here. We. I'm actually repeating myself now. Uh, when we have have the samples that potentially contain multiple radionuclides, a screening uh, procedure or protocol is very important before we do uh, the detailed assay. We need to screen the samples. I think that part, uh, US CDC uh, bioassay lab, they developed something simple, uh, not very comprehensive, but uh, uh, useful. Uh, I, I actually am thinking to develop something uh, for this part in the future. Uh, second one is gamma spec is very handy. In this case, uh, for ruthenium 106, it can be measured by, by gamma because rhodium 106 is very easy to do that. Uh, and uh, some labs, they did use this, uh, but they made some mistake. They married gamma for cis 7 and the rolling model 6, and they married gross beta. They compared the measurement from gamma and from a gross beta. They said they are similar. So the problem is that they missed strong humanity. <laughs> That's a very small one. Eh? You will see the numbers, you know, uh, 400 plus 80, 480. And uh, if you plus uh, 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 another 20, you get 500, 480, 500, very similar. So they missed the one. Um, so the overall, overall uh, impression for me is that you know, in, in this type of sample analysis, we, we, we are uh, not there yet. So that's why I have the last bullet here, never overestimate ourselves. 
We never say we are good in this part. Uh, very simple exercise, just give you give us these kind of numbers. Okay, Jonathan, remind me the time. Thank you. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. Any question I can answer? Yeah. So now is the break time for coffee. So uh, now is 3.21, so we're going to have it by um, 3.50. The cookies are...